Here we go. All right, so our first question is, the Georgia Secession Convention of 1861 met in what city? Now we have Savannah, Atlanta, Macon, or Milledgeville. So we're gonna give our members a chance to answer this. So we've already got two answers in there. So let's see if we can get this. The Georgia Secession Convention of 1861 met in what city? Again, it's Savannah, Atlanta, Macon, or Milledgeville. And folks, if you're watching at home, you can also put your guesses in the chat. All right, we've got our we've got three answers so far. Let's see what it is. Ah, so only one of our members got that one correct. Uh, the others thought it was Savannah, but let's learn a little bit more with Marie um, after we see who got that. Ah, nice. <laughs> Good job, Mrs. Rob. So the convention took place in Milledgeville, Georgia from January 16th to March 23rd of 1861. Arguments were made by both secessionists and the cooperationists, uh, not necessarily unionists, but uh, wanting to stay in cooperation with the union. Now, the final vote on March 23rd resulted in 208 delegates voting to secede from the union and only 89 voting to remain in the union. Therefore, Georgia did secede from the union and join the Confederate States of America. Now this was done in Milledgeville, Georgia because Milledgeville was the capital at the time that Georgia was in the Civil War. Now on the screen there you see the old Capitol building in Milledgeville, Georgia which you can still go and visit today. It was built in this beautiful Gothic style revived uh, gothic revival style. You can also visit the old governor's mansion, which is just a few blocks from it, which is built in a beautiful Greek revival style, one of the best examples of that type of architecture I've seen. Um, it's it's really interesting, this town of Milledgeville, uh, if you've ever been to Georgia State College, you've uh, walked on campus there. Uh, it is only after this Civil War that the capital is then moved to Atlanta and we get our new capital building that we have today in Atlanta and I actually just did a podcast about that new um, Atlanta capital building new being uh, about 140 years old but <laughs> you should definitely go and check it out on then again our podcast that's right excellent excellent all right here we go here is our next question Riots, often led by women, broke out in cities across Georgia due to Confederate conscription acts, food shortages, opposition to secession, or medical supply shortages. So members, go ahead, take your guesses. And of course, anyone in the chat, if you would like to uh, chat your guess, we would love to <laughs> know, uh, see what you think too. All right, so far we've got three answers. So let's see what it was. I'm going to give us, okay, so ah, most of you got it. It was indeed food shortages. So let's see who's in the lead now. Ah, so Mrs. Rob is in the lead with over a thousand points, almost 2,000 points, but Terry is close behind and Mrs. Rob has a streak of three correct answers in a row. Great job. All right, so let's learn a little bit more from Marie. So during the American Civil War, more cotton than food was being produced in Georgia, especially in the lower half of Georgia, which is sometimes referred to as quote unquote, the black belt, um, because uh, the quality of the soil is so much better and good for growing things. And the land is nice and flat and it's good for growing cotton. And that's where you have a large amount of plantation culture. Now, this that all happened despite legal restrictions on the amount of cotton that a planter could grow. Some planters would even smuggle cotton out of the South during this time because it was incredibly lucrative to do so. Now they had to usually smuggle this out past the Union blockade. But this growing of cotton did result in a food shortage that largely affected women and children in the South. Bread riots broke out across the state 
one such being in Columbus, Georgia, again, a southern Georgia town. And this one involved over 60 armed women who raided the downtown stores for food. Wow, and you can see on the screen a, a not a very flattering depiction of <laughs> the bread riots, but nonetheless, this was uh, depicted in newspapers across um, across the states. So uh, you can see there that there is a depiction of a bread riot as well as a historical marker that is uh, in Columbus, Georgia. All right, let's move on to our next question. Here we go. Ah, this is a... Oh, this is not a multi-select, sorry about that, oh no. <laughs> but select one, one. The largest battle in Georgia was the Battle of Chickamauga, Battle of Resaca, Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, or the Battle of Jonesboro. And again, this is just one answer. So which one was the largest battle fought in Georgia? I see we've got two answers so far. And of course, let us know in the chat what you think. So we're looking for the largest battle fought in Georgia. All right, we've got two answers so far. Uh, three answers, and I believe that's uh, the, our players. We've, we've got all of our answers from our players. So let's go ahead and see who got it right. Aha, uh -huh, so two players got it right. It was indeed the Battle of Chickamauga. Let's see if that changed the, uh, the ranks of our players. Uh, Miss Rob is still in the lead, but uh, Terry and Peter are also getting some points as well. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about the Battle of Chickamauga. So the Battle of Chickamauga was one of, well, it was the biggest in Georgia and one of the biggest total in the American Civil War, second largest right behind Gettysburg. The Battle of Chickamauga involved over 128,000 Confederate and Union soldiers and it was fought between September 18th and 20th of 1863. 1863, year of big battles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was the second deadliest battle in the entire Civil War, right behind Gettysburg with over 34,000 casualties. This battle also is considered one of the South's strongest victories. General James Longstreet, who would later live in Gainesville, actually led troops during this battle. Oh, wow, well, so a nice uh, local, very local connection since we are in Gainesville. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our next question. The Nancy Hearts Militia was an all-women's military unit formed to protect the home front in what Georgia city? Was it Macon, Georgia, Andersonville, Georgia, Sharpsburg, Georgia, or LaGrange, Georgia? Now, uh, coming across this, I was very surprised to see that there was an all-women's-led military unit. Um, I would really like to dive in uh, to this uh, for maybe a program later. It'd be very cool. All right, so we got two answers in so far. Let's see if we can get that third answer. There it is. And aha, oh, wow, very good. So most of you did know that indeed. So let's take a look at our scoreboard. Ah, very good. So Miss Rob's still in the lead. Very, very good. All right, so next, let's learn a little bit more about uh, the Nancy Hart Militia. So Nancy Hill Morgan <laughs> uh, and Mary Alfred Hurd were the wives of Confederate soldiers, and they were the ones who went on to form a female military company in LaGrange, Georgia in 1861. They received training with firearms from a local doctor and they called themselves the Nancy Hearts in honor of the legendary Nancy Hart, who we just did the whole <laughs> miniseries, little documentary about. Um, of course, Nancy Hart being a folk hero of the American Revolution, uh, so famous that we even have a, a whole county named after her. So the Nancy Hearts, they went on to serve as volunteer nurses when LaGrange became a medical and refugee center during the war. The Nancy Hearts um, did eventually face Union troops near the end of the war in April of 1865. Uh, and in, in that meeting, they agreed to surrender the, the town if homes were not destroyed. Ah, oh, okay. So, the, <laughs> yes, if homes and private property were not destroyed. That's, that seems pretty fair to me. So, yes. All right, excellent. Let's go on to our next question. Ah, true or false? Before the Civil War, nursing was traditionally a male occupation. 
True or false? Let's see what our members think. Ah, very true. They knew it. All of you got that correct. Indeed. So let's see if that changes our scores at all. All right, Miss, Mrs. Rob still in the lead. Awesome. So let's learn a little bit more about Civil War nurses. So while women have always cared for sick family members generally in their homes, nursing as an occupation was held by men before the Civil War in America. It only began to be, even be thought of as a female profession once Florence Nightingale, the famous lady with the lamp, began performing nursing duties in the Crimea War, which happened in the 1850s, so right, right before the American Civil War. But due to the high number of men needed, well, to go and fight in the Civil War, uh, and also there was an increasing demand for nurses because, well, when one has a battle, one has wounded after it, and also disease spread like wildfire through these camps. Therefore, women had to basically step up and, and fill that need, and also doctors were not in a position to turn them down. Uh, of course, nursing was strenuous, it was demanding, and it was also a dangerous job as women are exposed to these diseases like smallpox and typhoid, um, which were, of course, just caused terrible epidemics mm -hmm. throughout these camps. It is estimated that over 40,000 women served as nurses during the Civil War, and that, of course, includes enslaved and also free black women serving as well. Wow, wow. All right, we're gonna go on to our next question. Here we go. This writer, scientist, educator, and news reporter wrote Wartime Journal of a Georgia Girl, 1864 to 1865. Was it Augusta Jane Evans Wilson, Eliza Frances Andrews, Sarah Moore Grimke, or Sarah Morgan Dawson? So let's see what our members think. I was very interested uh, to learn about this woman, given that she had so she was a bit of a Renaissance woman. Yes. All right, we've got three answers in. Let's see if we've got one more for our members who are playing. Ah, oh, very. Oh, I see. So <laughs> a bit of a trick question for for y'all. You may have not heard of Eliza Frances Andrews. Well, lucky for us, we get to learn about her today. And it looks like uh, Mrs. Rob is still in the lead. Very good. So let's learn a little bit more about Mrs. Andrews. So Eliza Frances Andrews was born in Washington, Georgia in 1840. She belonged to a very prominent family as her father was a judge and also a planter or a plantation owner. Her journal gives us an insight into the lived experiences of particularly elite white women in the South during the Civil War. And some of her encounters uh, include interactions with Union soldiers, observations of how enslaved people reacted to the war, and how she and fellow white women attempted to keep a sense of normalcy during the war through social gatherings. You can easily read her journal online and also can find it in print. It is quite, quite the, the brick of a book. She had a lot to say. <laughs> I bet, yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds fascinating. Very good. All right, we're going on to our next question. During the Atlanta campaign, Confederate President Jefferson Davis replaced General Joseph E. Johnston with who? Was it Thomas Moore Scott, William Joseph Hardy, John B. Hood, or Joseph Wheeler? Ah, very good. So it looks like most of our members got that one. Let's see if that changed anything. Ooh, Carolee coming up in the ranks. Very good. But Mrs. Robb is still in the lead. So let's learn a little bit more about General John B. Hood. So General John B. Hood uh, took over the Atlanta campaign from Joseph E. Johnson. So after a series of retreats led by Joseph Johnston, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, decided that Johnston was not going to defend Atlanta well um, and was worried about losing Atlanta, so he decided to appoint John, uh, John B. Hood. And therefore, General John B. Hood, he accepted that command, and then he went on to lead uh, the Confederate forces during the Battle of Peachtree Creek and also the Battle of Atlanta, 
the Battle of Ant, and also during the Battle of Ezra Church, which are all at the end of the Atlantic campaign. Uh, what is interesting and different between John B. Hood and Johnston is Hood went on the offensive. He was very aggressive in his actions. Uh, and, well, spoiler alert in history, he didn't win. Atlanta still fell. Um, he evacuated Atlanta, burnt down a lot of the ammunition and supplies that the Confederates just could not take with them, but also didn't want them getting into Union hands. And then Atlanta fell to the Union troops in early September of 1864. General Hood was the youngest man to have command of an army at just 33 years old. Wow. All right, let's move on to our next question. Andersonville Prison was built to hold 10,000 prisoners, but actually held about 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, or 50,000. And there you can see a depiction of Andersonville Prison as well that was illustrated at the time. Now I see we've got three answers. I think we're waiting on one more. Ah, okay. Then most of you got that correct. It was indeed 30,000. Wow. So let's see if that changed the ranks at all. Up, oh, Mrs. Robb is still in the lead. Excellent. So let's learn a little bit more about Andersonville Prison. So the Andersonville Prison had absolutely terrible conditions due to extreme overcrowding. There was lack of supplies, there was lack of food, there was lack of sanitation, and also uh, a, a lack of proper housing. Mm -hmm. So that whole lack of sanitation situation uh, contaminated water from uh, the nearby creek and uh, well, disease ran rampant because there was just like that one little creek that went through the entire prison and uh, everyone did everything in it, mm -hmm. uh, which is not great for disease control. No. <laughs> uh, so about 13,000 of those mm -hmm. men died at Andersonville prison, mostly due to malnutrition also accompanied with disease, uh, it makes for an incredibly terrible situation. Yeah. Now, most of those people in Andersonville Prison, of course, those are all Union soldiers who ha were taken capt uh, taken prisoner and ca or captured um, by Confederate troops. And it is only after the war that the, well, basically this was like one of the worst things that like happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of terrible things that happened during the American Civil War. This is probably one of the worst war crimes, mm. um, the, this treatment of prisoners. Actually, the head of Andersonville Prison is the only man executed for war crimes from the Confederacy wow. during the Civil War. Uh, therefore, you can imagine how terrible that is. Um, but these men, at least, do get to have their names restored to them and their families notified after the Civil War. Um, th generally, thanks to Clara Barton for publishing um, these names, that were kept by a very empathetic and forward-thinking man hmm. um, who was doing most of the barrels. Wow, wow. I didn't realize there was a Clara Barton connection. Wow. Yes. All right, let's go on to our next question. This city was an industrial hub for the Confederacy and included the Confederate Naval Ironworks. Was it Columbus, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, Macon, Georgia, or Savannah, Georgia? So an industrial hub that was also home to the Naval Ironworks of the Confederacy. All right, we've got three answers. I think we're, aha, uh -huh. so, okay, it was a little bit split and I can totally understand why you'd go for uh, the big port city of Savannah, but it was indeed Columbus, Georgia. So let's let's see, ooh, nice. We got uh, Kara Lee rising in the ranks, but Mrs. Robb is still in the lead with the highest answer streak, great job. Let's learn a little bit more about Columbus. So Columbus, Georgia is situated on the Chattahoochee River, which made it an ideal location for industry. Columbus was home to massive textile factories that produced uniforms, tents, and other cloth materials for the war effort, as well as the Columbus or Confederate Naval Iron Works. So the Naval Iron Works supplied parts for the engines of many Confederate ironclads 
Today, you can see even the remains of the CSS Jackson at the National Civil War Naval Museum in Columbus, Georgia. The CSS Jackson was intentionally sunk by the Confederates when Wilson's raiders entered Columbus. The remains were um, excavated from the Chattahoochee River in the 1960s, almost 100 years after it got sunk. Yeah, and I've actually, um, I, I actually used to work at the National Civil War Naval Museum. It's a wonderful place. If you get a chance to visit, I highly encourage you to. And seeing the CSS Jackson in person is really cool. And, and one of the things that really surprised me was that you can still smell that burnt kind of fire smell from the hull from when it was burned so many years ago. All right, let's go on to our next question. A Confederate private received this amount of money each month until an increase in 1864. Was it $24 a month, $11 a month, $8 a month, or $32 a month? All right, let's see. Our members are getting in their answers. Ah, <laughs> only one person got that one right. It was indeed $11 a month. So let's see if that changes anything. Ah, very good, Carol Lee. Nice, you got the highest answer streak of four. Great comeback. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about um, the, the pay of the privates and Confederate money. So originally it was $11, and then this was increased to $18 a month in 1864, but inflation made this amount, $18, actually less valuable than the original $11 at the beginning of the war. This pay rate was about the same as pre-war pay rates, but the challenge was actually receiving the payment, <laughs> as, as it always is, right? Uh, they had that problem in the Rev War, too. So the inefficiencies of the paymaster um, department caused payment to be untimely. <laughs> And when the paymaster did arrive, soldiers would assemble by company to receive payment at a pay table. Officers were paid first and privates were paid last. And on the screen, you can see examples of um, Confederate privates from Georgia. And of course, I'm, I'm sure you can already note that uh, one is only is, is uh, 17 years old. This is a very famous photo of, of a young private in the Confederate Army. And of course, we have um, the word more typical age, I, I suppose, of the older gentleman. All right, let's move on to our next question. Confederate President Jefferson Davis was caught by Wilson's raiders in this Georgia town. Was it Irwinville, Georgia, Kennesaw, Georgia, Washington, Georgia, or Skidaway Island, Georgia? So let's see what our members think. Okay, we've got two answers in so far. They're still thinking. We've got three. <laughs> and of course you can see in the middle a depiction of <laughs> Jefferson Davis being caught. Ah, this was a bit split. It was indeed Irwinville, Georgia. So let's see if that changed our ranks. Ah, Mrs. Robbins still in the lead. Let's learn a little bit more about um, the situation in Irwinville, Georgia. All right, so Jefferson Davis was caught in Irwinsville, Georgia. Now, I know why a lot of you probably chose Washington, Georgia, and that is because where that, that is in Washington, Georgia, is where the last Confederate cabinet meeting was held. That's where he's fleeing from, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, and just trying to head south um, <laughs> away uh, from, from what he would assume where the, the troops were. But um, in May of 1865, Jefferson Davis, he was pursued by Union forces through Georgia. Um, and the Union forces were very, very much wanting to capture him, not just because he was the president of this, this rebel nation, but also because they believed that he was probably complicit in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, that made people very, very angry. And there was even a $100,000 reward for his capture, which is a very large sum of money for mm -hmm. the time. Now, on the morning of May 9th, Davis was apprehended by the members of the 4th Michigan Cavalry, And Davis was found to be wearing his wife's overcoat. How that happened, there's lots of stories about. <laughs> but basically, because he was wearing his wife's overcoat, because he grabbed the wrong thing when he ran out the door, 
uh, this led to uh, rumors that he was trying to disguise himself as a woman and that they found him in woman's clothing, just like a whole hoop skirt and everything. And <laughs> there's many funny depictions in cartoons. Um, but he was then transported to Virginia where he then remained a prisoner for over two years as they basically decided what they should do with Confederate leaders. And there you see on the screen uh, one of those depictions of uh, Jeff Davis in his traveling costume, her, uh, hoop skirt and all. So, <laughs> All right, let's go to our next question. This granted formerly enslaved African Americans land, including the Sea Islands of Georgia. Was it Special Field Orders Number 67, General Order Number 143, General Orders Number 30, or Field Order Number 15. All right, let's see what we've got. Ah, okay, so most, uh, it seemed like it was a bit split. Let's see. So it was indeed um, Special Field Orders Number 15. So let's learn a little bit more. And this was our last question, so we'll also see who our winner was next. But let's learn a little bit more from Marie. So Field Order Number 15 which was given by General Sherman. This order confiscated southern land along the coastline of South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia, and then redistributed that land to newly freed African Americans. This order came after Sherman met with 20 black community leaders in Savannah, Georgia, to discuss how to best support newly freed African American refugees, because the Union Army was having a problem with this, because they weren't really sure what to do, and no one had really given them that. Th this was a whole new thing. No one mm -hmm. really knew what to do. So he, he decided this was probably a good idea. President Lincoln approved the order just four days after this meeting. So obviously he was very much in favor of it. And then this order, sadly, was or uh, overturned by President Andrew Johnson in 1865. Uh, and therefore, it never happened. But if you ever heard that line in Gone with the Wind, you know, um, you're going to get 40 acres and a mule. That's where that came from, is this field order number 15. Wow. All right, my friends. So let's go ahead and see who our winner is. So we have in third place, Terry. Woohoo! <laughs> Good job, Terry. In second place, we have Carolee. Woo! Congratulations, Carolee. And in first place, we have Mrs. Rob. Congratulations, Mrs. Rob. And as our winner, you are going to be uh, gifted a digital membership to share with a friend or family who is not a digital member yet. So uh, do be sure to, um, I'll chat you in our, in our Zoom, <laughs> to, to make sure you can email me so you can share the gift of history with someone. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this was a lot of fun uh, to have y'all here. And uh, do become a digital member uh, because next time we have a, a fun trivia all about the works and the life of Edgar Allan Poe, just in time for the spooky season of October. And of course, if you are a teacher in Georgia or if you lead a homeschool group, then our digital members are actually free for you. So we do encourage y'all. Um, our virtual trivia nights are relatively new, so uh, we do, we're very excited to continue this. Thank you so much to the members that joined us. And, and thanks so much, Marie, for uh, providing those answers and context Absolutely. for us. All right, everybody, uh, take care. This was 